The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right. In the last class, we looked at the architecture and urbanism of the world that was known to the Mongolians. And during that class, I had introduced uh, Janet Abu Lugod's idea that a pre-modern world system existed circa 1300. And just to refresh your memory, I thought I'd put up the excerpt that I showed the last time as well. And uh, I think in our continuing effort to understand uh, the architectural and geographic dimensions of uh, Abu Lugod's assertion that I'm showing here on the slide number two, uh, that circa 1300, the globe was integrated through exchange in unprecedented ways, we want to today examine port cities. And specifically, we'll look at ports on the Indian Ocean that facilitated global exchange and, and this is sort of important for today, and nurtured new tastes for luxuries and ornaments like silk and porcelain. Now, on slide number three, I've added to uh, the slide that we began with cities in yellow that constitute the major uh, global ports circa 1300 across uh, the Indian Ocean region, which is to say not just ports that were necessarily on the Indian Ocean, but certainly also um, ports like Alexandria and Guangzhou refer to um, in subsequent European accounts as Canton, uh, that certainly were connected in the network of uh, Indian Ocean area trade. Now, besides thinking about the architectural connections and social re relationships across these ports, it is important to analyze the relationship between ports and non-coastal centers of power, commerce, and production. And I'm thinking here of uh, specifically the relationship that uh, emerges around uh, the, the early part of the 1200s between Kish, Karmaz, and Shiraz, which at that time was newly emerging as a center of political and commercial power. Um, I also just want to say that what I've tried to do through this map is indicate that most cities in the Indian Ocean region on the coast were in fact spatially rather small. And it's really only a few places like Alexandria that we get uh, that are significantly different in scale. Uh, I think no less important are the connections between ports and places of pilgrimage. And while the map on slide number four is not intended as an exhaustive list of major religious sites in the 14th century, it does list places that we know uh, influential traders visited, in some cases routinely. Uh, Mecca, for example, was the site of a large market in the mid-14th century, and numerous traders uh, journeyed from uh, Cairo, or Fustat, as it was known then, uh, via Suez to Jidda, and then overland to Mecca for religious and commercial purposes. So what uh, preliminary inferences can we draw from this specific example of Mecca? So let us begin our work today by trying to define port cities as um, hubs that connect to non-coastal markets, landmarks, and production centers, as zones of commerce that are linked to one another. And what I mean by zones of commerce is that it's not always just the jetty on the water that makes a port a port. It's also the relationships that exist in the immediate region surrounding that uh, coastal settlement that allows for certain places we find to emerge as uh, a port city of, of global consequence. And finally, the third point, or the third, third defining characteristic might seem a little abstract, uh, but, but I'll try and give as concrete an example as I can, uh, is that politically, port cities are not just any other town or village in a kingdom. Uh, they seem to have a very special relationship to, say, the capital of a kingdom, or even other cities or other places in a given place or state. Um, for example, we know that in many cases in the Indian Ocean region, ports were often autonomous, uh, but in all kinds of tributary relationships with uh, certain centers of power. Uh, the main point that I want to, however, emphasize in, in this effort to define a global port city is that it's not just a city on the water. We do not want to indulge in the myth of geographic determinism. 
If that were true, then the entire coastline of East Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, the Deccan, and Southeast Asia would have been littered with port cities. And yet we know this is not the case circa 1300. And if we look specifically at a mid 20th century uh, archaeological uh, mapping of settlements on the East African coast on slide number six on the left hand side, we see that in fact there were settlements all throughout uh, the coast region. Uh, and that's really an enlargement just of this area. And yet we find no evidence of a major urban settlement devoted to global trade, uh, except for a place like Kilwa, which is one of our case studies for today. Uh, moreover, we find that not all port cities were equal. Some were more important than others, even though the same sailors and merchants visited both major and minor ports. Throughout this class, we will want to return to this question then. Why were some port cities architecturally grander or more commercially important than others? And uh, the best I could do to, in some senses, uh, suggest the hierarchy between major and minor global ports was on uh, slide number seven to provide these dashed circles around uh, the cities that we know from uh, travel accounts and, fr and from records uh, pertaining to merchants uh, from the uh, 12th and 13th century that these, in fact, seem to have been the major zones of, of international exchange. Now, a lot of what we know about this part of the world and from this time period comes to us from economic and social histories of the Indian Ocean. That branch of history refers to this trade as the Dhau trade, a Dhau being the particular kind of sailboat used by Arab merchants and sailors at this time to navigate the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. And here on slide number eight on the left hand side, we have a 13th century uh, illustration from manuscript, al Hiriri's uh, Maqamat. And I'm grateful to Anika Lenson for uh, helping me decipher this uh, particular manuscript. It's believed to have been illustrated by somebody from the town of Wastit. And that's why it says by al Wastiti. And, and Wastit itself was a minor um, a trading post inland in between, um, uh, uh, well, just sort of off Basra uh, to, on the route to Baghdad. Uh, so in all likelihood, uh, Al-Wastiti, whoever he may have been, may have been deeply familiar with what Adhao was, although uh, some later historians have pointed to certain inaccuracies in this particular illustration. The only thing I wanted to point to was the presence of uh, the merchant figures in this illustration itself. Um, and on the right-hand side, on the same slide, we have a contemporary sort of 20th century photograph of Adhau docked in Kuwait. Now, how did these boats get across? For this, some attention to geography actually would be helpful. The monsoons, the word itself derived from the Arabic mausim, meaning weather, are periodic winds. And on slide number nine, uh, this taken from Janet Abu Lugod's book, uh, I show how, or she shows how, uh, in fact, the winds move in the summer from the high pressure area off the Indian Ocean um, onto the landmass, which is a low pressure area, and then reverse in the winter. Uh, now, the implication of all of these uh, patterns appears to be that the trade routes followed by uh, merchants and, and sailors at this time tended to stick fairly close to the coastline. And uh, there's some backup of our surmise of this in the form of uh, travel accounts from the 13th and 14th centuries. Now, drawing on translations of these travel accounts, as well as later studies of standing buildings, we will look in depth at four ports. Each case is architecturally and historically distinct, although all four were visited by the same merchants, clerics, and sailors during this time period. And our Four principal case studies are, um, I'm on slide number 11 now, um, uh, Kilwa in East Africa, uh, Kambay situated really at the head of the Gulf of Kambay, uh, Mangro situated in the, in the Deccan Peninsula, and Majapahit in uh, Southeast Asia, in the island uh, based out of or centered on the island of Java. Starting then with um, Kilwa, which, and I've sort of held on to the map with all the cities over here, so we have some thumbnail guide, Kilwa located here uh, off uh, the coast of modern-day Tanzania. 
Cuba, in fact, is a remarkably small island, as you can see. Um, and, and what we have with it is a powerful entry port or trading post where merchandise was imported and re-exported, each such transaction profiting Kilwa's small trading and ruling community. It's also thought that Kilwa, uh, on account of its military might, was able to preserve its position as the key point on the trade route of Southern African gold uh, coming from Sofola and heading up towards uh, Hadrami, uh, uh, Hadramat, uh, the, the Rasulid uh, kingdom of Hadramat here in, in, in present day Aden, but certainly also to Mamluk Egypt, both of which had a tremendous taste uh, for gold. Now, as I suggested, it's a rather small island, and even more interestingly than that for me was that uh, it's really less than about four square kilometers of this island that appear to have been settled as an entreport uh, in the 13th century. Although there is some evidence that there was outerlying agrarian and fishing settlements as well on the same island. And uh, our main interest for today in terms of uh, 12th and 13th century or even 14th century structures is the Great Mosque of Kilwa, uh, shown here on uh, slide 13 with, with the red outline. Uh, but certainly there are other structures here of historical note from later periods that people have paid considerable attention to the fort and the Makatuni complex there. Now, the oldest sections of the Great Mosque of Kilwa date back to the 11th century, to when the ruling uh, elite of Kilwa may have been Shiai rather than Sunni. And the oldest sections, if you're uh, with me on slide 14, is really this part here. It's rather narrow, subsequently enlarged um, around the 14th century. These are the original paving stones that seem to date back to the very early 11th century, possibly even, some dispute, but possibly even the late 10th century. Uh, and here we have a, a plan for the Great Mosque that allows us to understand uh, the different phases of building activity the darkest lines representing uh, the work that was first commenced in the 11th century. Uh, this larger uh, southern extension, so labeled the larger prayer hall, actually comes from the 14th century, although in the form that we find the ruin today, Kilwa was discovered in 1955 by British archaeologists. And what they in fact found was a 15th century reconstruction uh, where stone pillars had replaced the coral block that had been used uh, originally to, to build um, the, the columns or pillars that we see here in plan. Uh, what's interesting about coral construction, and here is a photograph on the left of slide 16 of um, the Great Mosque itself with the coral blocks, is that um, this particular construction style or method is more generally associated with an architectural surveys to the Red uh, Seaport town of Swakin, um, in present-day Sudan. Uh, right immediately adjacent to the immediate south of the Great Mosque is the Great House. And I'm not really going to spend any amount of time describing the Great House, but um, I just want to say that from its footprint and from the archaeological remnants that were found on the site, uh, scholars have come to believe that this structure was probably home to a powerful merchant family and uh, that in fact the oldest parts of the structure date back to the 14th century and that it was in continuous use, it would appear, up until the 16th century. Um, I'm certainly intrigued, but was unable to find any definitive evidence to suggest that the presence of a merchant family so close uh, to the main congregational mosque, in fact, might suggest that the mosque itself was somehow institutionally connected to uh, mercantile activity, but um, there's no uh, real backup evidence uh, for that. Um, I just want to briefly turn, so all that we looked at, if you're with me on slide 18, all we had looked at was sort of just in this area, this sort of um, westernmost tip of the island of Kilwa. 
What I want to do now is briefly turn to structures that are here in this part of the island, um, and, and specifically to the Husuni Kubwa uh, complex, uh, although it should be noted that there's an other older 12th century structure here, Husuni Dogo, uh, which I just find remarkable, not least of all because of its planned condition. But again, we, we know so little about it that it's hard to really make uh, a sensible story out of it. On the other hand, Husni Kubwa is a truly remarkable, strange, but certainly at the very least wonderful story. Uh, the collective best guess on Husni Kubwa was that it accommodated a complex mix of public, private, and commercial programs. Uh, this may, for example, have very well been where Ibn Battuta stayed when he visited Kilwa in 1331. Uh, in stark contrast to the other landmarks at, uh, uh, in Kilwa on this island, the Husni Kubwa has no columns. Uh, the roofing structure is supported instead by load-bearing walls, um, which I think is, is quite interesting and uh, unprecedented. You don't find any other structure that survives at least on the island that, that uses that uh, tectonic system. Uh, it's possible that work on the complex was never completed and that in all likelihood the site was altogether abandoned sometime after 1335 when the Sultan, who was the building's patron, died. Um, and what's interesting, I described this sort of mix of, of commercial, public, and private uh, programs within the complex. Uh, here you have these two different courts that are used in a variety of ways uh, for political as well as for trading purposes. Uh, a, a palace court used much more privately. And then a south court, which uh, was more connected with the storage facilities uh, that form a part of um, uh, Husni Kubwa. And uh, the word Husn, or its root, the, the, the root Husn in, in the word Husni, uh, probably referred to the strength of its fortification. And, I particularly like this uh, reconstruction and model because you can just sort of imagine pulling up in one of those small dows and sort of seeing this immense uh, structure strung along uh, this, this raised uh, embankment, as it were. Uh, it, it must have been quite a sight, if not uh, formidable and daunting in some ways. Um, now, this is an axonometric reconstruction done um, a few decades ago uh, by archaeologists of um, the Husni Kubwa complex based mostly on uh, ruins, particularly the roofing system, which is really an interesting hodgepodge of, of different schemes, had collapsed and sort of where it's collapsed and they've sort of extrapolated out and drawn up uh, the axonometric that we see on slide 21. Um, the palace is ornamental pool. This one here has been likened to a form found in Mamluk, Egypt. Uh, the conical domes have been likened to ten-shaped ones found in Persia and Seljuk, Turkey. And I bring all this up just to say that if any of these connections bear out, how should we think about them? Should it be in interpreted as evidence of globe-trotting architects? Or does it prove that Kilwa's elite, through trade and travel, were aware of architectural wonders in distant uh, metropolises? Or was it a 14th century architectural attempt by Kilwa's elite to claim Persian ancestry? Ultimately, we can be much surer about the import and deployment of luxury ornaments like the Yuan vase and porcelain found amongst Kilwa's remnants than we can be about any of the questions that might explain uh, the particular fashioning of the Husni Kubwa complex. Um, what I suggest is that new tastes uh, like the Rasulid and Mamluk taste for gold or the taste for porcelain and uh, this here is blue and white pottery from Iran, uh, Yuan vase, that the taste for these items in fact is what drives sea trade. My point is distinct from the idea that increased, in, increased exchange or the globalization of trade created surpluses that were converted into domestic luxuries. Rather, 
in Kilwa and in the other cities we will visit uh, today, textiles facilitate a trade. To paraphrase one of my favorite characters on Ugly Betty, in the medieval, uh, fashion was currency. Uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking of the original scene. Uh, Sort of continuing with our uh, survey, Don, I want to now move, in fact, to Cambay. And uh, here we have uh, a satellite image of the Gulf of Cambay with the modern city of Kambat or Cambay located here. And I think part of what this uh, satellite image composes, it is, in fact, of different sheets, uh, helps us understand is that this area has now largely silted. And that all that we see here, particularly, in fact, was water in um, the 13th and 14th and even up to the 15th century. And this is, in fact, what made Kambat, in Marco Polo's words, one of the largest and most magnific magnificent ports that he'd ever been to. And, and uh, writing a few decades later, Ibn Battuta said much the same thing. It's actually still a very small town. I mean, its footprint is not even covered uh, by the generic icon thrown on by uh, Google Earth. Um, and one can only imagine that the um, 13th century town was uh, smaller. Now, what's interesting about Cambay is that it was certainly connected to the Delhi Sultanate, uh, but it's not clear that it was directly ruled by it in the 13th century. And we want to return to this theme a couple of times. The principal building that I want to talk about here is the Jame Masjid, the Friday Congregational Mosque. And again, just sort of look at the uh, topographical, geographical detail here, we can be quite sure that the waterfront was actually quite close to where uh, the Jame Masjid had been built in 1325, if you look at your slide list. Uh, we're on slide number 24. This is by far the most widely documented landmark in Cambay, and uh, although built uh, or the one that we look at is built in 1325. It was probably not the first Jami or Friday mosque in the city. Um, it's, I think, most uh, prominent features might be uh, this central courtyard and the roofing system, which consists of 21 domes uh, supported by uh, 156 columns and 70 pilasters, all of which rise to 15 feet. And we'll see. Um, some photographs and plans of this. Um, this a relatively recent photograph taken by an architectural historian who completed her dissertation at Harvard a few years ago. Um, and so here you get a sense of the extent to which uh, light and air comes in uh, to these colonnaded walkway spaces uh, precisely because, in fact, they rise uh, to, to 15 feet. And here on slide number 26, we have uh, a plan. And here we have the columns. And this is what I say totals up to 156. And the pilasters back on the wall, like so. Um, the area on this slide, uh, denoted by the red dashed line, is the enclosure for the Al Kazeruni tomb. And uh, this, in fact, in the center is his tomb from. Uh, 1333, and the one adjacent to it is uh, his daughter's from 1381. Uh, give you a sense of the courtyard. The photograph on slide number 27 on the left is an archival photograph taken by the great or notorious, depending on your perspective, uh, archaeologist Henry Cousins. And um, I think it sort of luckily gives us a very good sense of what we see in plan, this structure being what we see here, that's that. And uh, that previous photograph that I had shown you of the colonnade was sort of taken looking that way. Uh, just one last architectural feature to point out is this portico. This sort of becomes important for our understanding, not just of the building, um, but of uh, architectural and commercial culture in uh, Cambay circa 1300. Um, now, architectural historians drawing partly on in, in Arabic inscriptions and partly on formal analysis of the building, including the portico and ceilings, have suggested that this mosque was in part a reconstruction of a 12th century mosque on the same site. And here you actually have 
um, ceiling fragments uh, dating not as far back as the 12th century, but uh, according to Alka Patel, who was the uh, former uh, doctoral student at Harvard that I referenced earlier, uh, quite definitively dates it to the 13th century. I pulled up uh, translations of two inscriptions from two different mosques uh, found in Cambe, um, mostly because I think it gives us a tremendous way to understand the nature of patronage in a port city like Cambe, with its particular kind of links to the Delhi Sultanate, but also to global trade and to uh, places like Hormaz in the Persian Gulf. Uh, some of the key things I think to pay attention to is that it is a bequest of personal or, or one might translate it as private property, um, and that a certain kind of relationship between uh, the merchant and the sultan is, is expressed um, in uh, these passages. I also just absolutely love the second uh, ins inscription, which sort of ends with the prayer for the architect. And, and I imagine that, that Frank Gehry would just love it if Susan Hockfield would pray for him occasionally. Um, I, I think that these inscriptions prove that it was merchants rather than sultans uh, who were the patrons uh, for at least the major mosques that we have in the 14th century uh, in, in Cambe specifically. Uh, I think they also, like I said, express this relationship of benefactor and beneficiary that existed between the sultan and the merchant. And uh, I sort of bring all this up because unfortunately within standard South Asian architectural history, Cambe is portrayed as a Muslim town. And so thus, you know, despite the significant presence of non-Muslim merchant groups in uh, the 14th century, or the fact that Muslim merchant groups other than the state are patronizing architecture. Uh, despite both these things, all architectural surveys tend to focus exclusively on the city's mosques and, and sort of exclusively trying to attribute them um, to the state, even when the epigraphic evidence so clearly points to the fact that they were built by merchants. Um, to just sort of reinforce this point of that, in fact, continuing in the 13th and 14th centuries to exist a tremendously vibrant uh, iconographic and architectural practice associated with non-Muslim merchant groups, Hindu and Jain merchants specifically, I want to show this early 13th century portrait depicting a family of merchants. Uh, and this portrait was installed at a shrine that they supported in Cambe. And sadly, the shrine has not been documented at all. We have nothing by way of an architectural drawing to, to make any sense of it. And I was particularly disheartened when I discovered that I simply uh, could not even locate, using Google Earth, the city Shantinath Temple, uh, which housed one of the earliest Jain Grantha Bhandars or scripture storerooms that was ever built. The best I was able to do, and we're on slide 31, uh, was to locate copies of the only illustrations found amongst the Grantha Bhandar's scriptural and literary texts. Now, a Grantha Bhandar is a bit like our very own library storage annex at MIT. Uh, it was, it's, 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 a, it's a storage room that nobody really sees, but if you wanted to consult, if you were an ascetic or a monk and you wanted to consult uh, a rare manuscript, there was a way in which you could page it. Um, this is an entirely new program in the late 12th century. There's no evidence of Jains or really anybody else uh, in this region having previously stored so many manuscripts in a single place. And in fact, there is no extant Jain manuscript dating to before the 11th century at all. Now, although the Yazembek and Prakash textbook does not exclusively uh, deal with medieval port cities. Its year 1000 chapter introduces us to Jainism and describes Jains as an important mercantile community. I found this section uh, a little troubling. Um, for one, there's a large body of Jain iconography and architecture from preceding periods, notably at Ellora. So in other words, if there were to be some kind of introduction of Jainisms or Jains, the year 1000 doesn't necessarily feel like the best place to have done it. Um, but moreover, I would suggest that a global history of architecture should avoid organizing information into civilizational categories in the first place. 
Nonetheless, I want to make sure that we do cover a few giant sites that bear on our understanding of global port cities. And for that, we move to the Deccan and specifically to the area that constitutes um, uh, what we now politically refer to uh, as Karnataka. And uh, while it's not a coastal town and while it was never a hub in global trade, the Jain complex at Shravan Belgola is important to coastal Karnataka, and I will describe how so. And it is featured uh, quite prominently in the Azimbek and Prakash textbook that we use. Now, we're at slide 34, and uh, by far the most well-known, and some might say significant um, element within the complex of Jain shrines at uh, Shravan Belgola is the statue of Bahubali, carved out of single stone around 981 AD. At uh, 57 feet, it's probably the most widely known Bahubali statue there is in the world. Now, the statue shows Bahubali in a meditative pose, his clothes having withered away and creepers beginning to climb up his limbs. In Jain epic li literature, Bahubali's renunciation followed a battle between him and his elder brother over their kingdom and wealth. While fighting, as Bahubali raised his arm to strike his brother, he realized the folly of, his, of fighting his own brother over land, wealth, and power. And so instead of striking him and killing him, essentially, he raised his arm and removed his hair. Now, renunciation during or immediately after a battle, and in the Bahubali epic, um, renunciation is sort of inaugurated by this ad hoc tonsure ceremony uh, that he conducts, is a key trope in um, Jain heroic literature. And I think that in sculpture, what we have is Bahubali presented naked, that is victorious over his desire for wealth and power, and thus appears to us as the paradigmatic hero. Uh, as I suggested, the Shravan Belgola complex uh, is much more than just the statue, and it's sort of a very overcast shot, but uh, that's sort of it. it. Actually, the complex consists of three different hills that have a variety of shrines, um, and uh, also sort of this, for example, here on, on slide 35 on the lower right corner is a wall painting uh, that depicts the Jain uh, cosmology. The site is perhaps best known in popular imagination for the Mahamastak Abhisheka ceremony, which is when devotees bathe and anoint the statue with milk, water, sugarcane, juice, turmeric, saffron, vermilion, and sandalwood. Offerings of gold and silver coins are also uh, made at this point, and more recently, a helicopter will sort of shower petals over it. Uh, that was sort of all adds to the contemporary spectacle. Now, the ceremony is held every 12 years, with the first one dating back to the 11th century, and the most recent one was held in 2006. Uh, I actually just love these photographs just because of the, of the color, you know, in sort of working with plans that were drawn in the 1950s and 60s, they tend to have yellowed, and that's the only color you see. But, you know, here with the vermilion and, and turmeric, these colors are quite something to look at. Uh, this woman here is performing uh, her last rite as, uh, a, a, in her secular life, uh, she will become a nun when she completes the ceremony. And this is not the same woman, but this is in fact uh, a Jain monk uh, or nun uh, praying at the feet of the Bahubali statue just days before the last uh, Mahamastak Abhisheka ceremony. The other thing about these photographs that I really like, and I'll have another one that's going to help us even more, is um, it, it shows us quite clearly the prominence of these inscriptions. And uh, in fact, there are more than 800 inscriptions uh, from across the 10th to about the 14th century, 15th century in uh, at Shravan Belgola. And I think what makes uh, the ones at the, at the Bahubali uh, feet particularly important, uh, not just for literary and cultural history, but also for our uh, purposes in our attempt to do a global uh, survey of what a port city was at this time period uh, is less the content of the inscription, which just translates to Chamundraya made this, and Chamundraya was a minister in, in the kingdom that patronized 
the construction of, of the statue, but really that it was inscribed in three different languages uh, using four different scripts. And that this act of inscription marked the inauguration of a very new political and social imagination. Uh, whereas for the previous 10 centuries, courts like the one Chamundaraya had belonged to had used and patronized Sanskrit literature exclusively, starting somewhere around the 10th century, uh, multiple desh bhashas or languages of place began to be used in place of Sanskrit. And uh, while it's impossible to give a singular account of the shift in this practice, the so-called vernacularization, uh, that incidentally is taking place at about the same time the vernacularization of Europe is taking place, which itself might be worth uh, another kind of global study. Uh, so while it's impossible to really provide a singular account of vernacularization, we know for sure that global trade and the emergence of highly localized centers of power in this period are a part of the story, are a part of why uh, not one, as it is in the sort of 19th century embrace of, of vernaculars for the purposes of modern nationalism, but in fact multiple languages of place come to be used in, in court which had otherwise up until then been singly using Sanskrit. And it is within the architectural story of the emergence of localized centers of power within a global system that we find ourselves visiting Karkal and Mudbidri, still within the Deccan area in the sort of area just immediately adjacent to the Mangalore port. And you remember that I said that Mangalore was sort of our, our third case study. And it's really a, a case of what I call a zone of commerce. And I'll, I'll do a better job of defining that. So it was in the agricultural lands that surround Karkal and Mudbidri that native Tulu-speaking merchants would buy produce to then sell to uh, Arabic-speaking merchants based in Mangalore. Uh, Turunad, the, uh, literally meaning the land of Tulu-speaking people and the term generally applied to the Mangalore area, is a good example of a globally linked zone of commerce. When we looked at the Jame Masjid in Kambe, I had pointed to the patronal role of merchants in the 14th century in that particular city. I want to now focus on other ways in which different religious institutions intersected with the crisscross of global trade. We know for sure that mosques con constituted a network of credit and social infrastructure that nurtured seafaring and overland trade. And I suspect something similar can be said of the sites, the Jain shrines at Karkal and Mudbidri. And now basically from uh, slides 39 to 45, we're going to watch television. We're just going to sail through this really quickly. These are mostly, in fact, sites that um, are from the 15th and 16th century. These are the most interesting ones are. Uh, but there were certainly significant uh, sites now more or less ruined from the 11th through 14th centuries. Um, they were built by Jain merchants. They were built on land owned and donated by Jain merchants. And it is in the um, repositories of uh, these places that we find documents related to trade that begin to suggest that temples, but certainly also religious schools, all supported trade in a variety of ways, perhaps even serving as vehicles of credit and investment. Um, this is, in fact, a second Bahubali statue. And this is sort of it from the Google Sat image. And, and it's not as tall as the one in Shravan Belgola, but is built in the late 14th century uh, by a local merchant who owned the land to rival that other place of pilgrimage. Um, and subsequently, um, in the sort of mid to late 15th century, we have this rather interesting uh, structure of the Chaturmukh uh, Basadi, unprecedented at its time in, in um, the region. Um, I wanted to show you uh, one, again, religious complex, but this time not uh, Jain, but rather Vaishnav, on uh, closer to the coastline in the area around Udpi. And um, again, I'll just watch this, I think, as television. Oh, this is Mudbidri, sorry. I should have shown you these images earlier. Uh, all of these roof structures over here are, in fact, uh, Jain sites, many of them dating back to the 12th and 13th century. Mudbidri's uh, Thousand Pillar Temple is later. Um, but 
really interesting architecturally, and these are taken from the Granth Bhandar or storeroom um, uh, from that the Thousand Pillar Temple. And I want to call sort of particular attention to uh, this palm leaf manuscript, uh, which illustration which depicts Bahubali, and you can already see the creepers sort of coming up. And uh, that illustration would have been done about the same time as the statue, maybe about a hundred years later. Um, so this is the complex in uh, Udpi. Uh, it has again a variety of programs that are situated within the complex. Uh, one of the more interesting things I think to talk about for our purposes is the history attributed to the central Krishna icon in the Anantheshwar temple within the complex is that it was found on a beach uh, by the founder of the particular sect uh, that, um, that this uh, complex formed the sort of architectural center of. And uh, the, the legend is that it was rescued from a shipwreck and that the icon originated from Gujarat, uh, from the Gulf of Cambay, in fact. And uh, this is very much the nature of trade that, in fact, does not occur overland at this point in time precisely for artifacts like religious idols. It, in fact, comes by a sea route, even when it's just coming from the Gulf of Cambay to the Deccan. The other thing to say about this complex is that unlike uh, all the other buildings that we've looked at so far, uh, this one is principally a, a timber structure and sadly one that has not been adequately studied architecturally. Uh, this complex is probably best known at least within the region, if not more globally, uh, the, the blonde hair can evince that, um, that uh, by uh, a particular festival that takes place in, in the middle of January every year in which these uh, uh, chariots, this one dating back to the 15th century, are actually pulled around the complex on a street appropriately named Car Street. And you know, part of my interest in even bringing up uh, any of these uh, sites, the, the Jain ones as well as the Vaishnav ones, is there's an active theorizing of beauty that is taking place at this time uh, in these uh, religious contexts, other than courtly contexts. And it's, it's being, the beauty is being actively theorized by ascetics and monks. And I think that there's a rich set of studies that uh, could be done on uh, the relationship between uh, that sort of theorizing of the aesthetic and uh, in fact the material culture that we find in the Manglo port um, around this time, particularly it's the, the sort of vast uh, or wide uh, prevalence of things like Chinese silk and, and other fabrics uh, and other luxury items uh, at the this domestic level itself. And so our final case study today comes from Sumatra and Java and is perhaps going to be the least satisfying and I know that's not the best note to end on. Um, at the beginning of the class, I suggested that port cities were a distinct political type. Uh, Kilwa was probably a single island state. Kambi and the many towns of Tulunad were certainly related uh, to the Delhi Sultanate and the Vijayanagar Empire, respectively, but seemed to have retained a fair measure of autonomy. However, it does not seem that 14th century Kambi had substantial military resources of its own, unlike Kilwa. And by contrast, also, boats approaching the Mangalore port uh, appear to have been regularly attacked by pirates, and travel accounts from the period provide some sense that local chieftains were only able to provide sporadic protection from something like pri uh, piracy. Now, the Sri Vijaya kingdom of early medieval Sumatra, on the other hand, offers an interesting comparative story. Uh, the kingdom included a network of small ports uh, along the east coast of Sumatra from Pasai to Jambi, which is here, which were, it would seem, all controlled independently of each other and from Palembang, uh, Palembang sorry, which was a, an inland uh, center of political power and the capital of Srivijaya up until the 11th century. Uh, we seem to know from, or our best guess using epigraphic evidence is that each port was controlled 
by a local military functionary of the, of the Shivajaya kingdom who may or may not have also been a landowner or a merchant. You have some cases in which their title very clearly refers to the fact that they were occupying two stations, military chief and merchant or military chief and landowner. And so coming to our last couple of slides, 54 and 55, um, we see that this sort of relationship between the political center and trading periphery was maintained by the later Majapahit kingdom of Java. Uh, in fact, the Javanese poem Desavarnana, more commonly known as Nagar Kritagama, uh, written in 1365, lists Tamasek, which is modern Singapore, uh, as one of the dependencies of Majapahit. Now, sadly, uh, only a few buildings from the Majapahit kingdoms uh, remain, and most of them in the village, really, of uh, Trolan in Java, eastern Java. Uh, what's interesting about these buildings is they represent an almost complete abandonment of stone as a building material in favor of brick. Uh, we have no explanation for the shift in this practice, uh, but it is worth uh, saying, however, that in other parts of Java in the 14th century, brick continued to be used, uh, sorry, stone continued to be used, and amongst the Majapahit ruins, we still find um, stone uh, icons and, and some statuary. Um, we also know, incidentally, from travel accounts that buildings in coastal Java, and Majapahit and Trolan are still uh, located further inland, uh, were built almost exclusively of wood, which might explain why there are no standing structures from this period. Uh, now, this particular image that we have here on slide 54 of the Bajangratu gate um, is, I have very little to say for it because so little has been studied of it. Uh, it's about 50 feet high. Um, an analysis of its iconographic program has led scholars to think that the gate was used to enter a holy building commemorating the death of King uh, Jayanagara in 1328. And uh, it's believed that he was reborn as Vishnu, or at least that is the tale that the iconographic program suggests. Um, oops. Uh, slide 55, the uh, other structures uh, that are found, Majapahit, and this is literally it, um, are, uh, I've labeled them, so it's, it's Chandi Brahu and, and Chandi Tinkus, which I don't know why they still call it that, because it means the sort of rat breeding tank uh, in Bahasa, um, which is obviously not what it was used for, it was a ritual bathing place. Um, but, I, but I guess we just don't know what the old Javanese uh, name for it was. Um, there are possibly other structures for uh, Majapahit in the Trolan area, but also elsewhere. Uh, evidence from a surface survey conducted in the early 90s points to the existence of manufacturing and long distance trading activities uh, within Trolan itself. So again, we see this relationship between a highly um, uh, well-defined here, brick structure, a capital complex, um, but accommodating programs associated with, with trade that was coming long distance being from the coast into uh, this more inland settlement. Uh, so, like I said, perhaps not the most satisfying note to end on, but end we do, and in the next class, we'll look at the Iberian world and the world system it creates in the 16th century and thereabouts. Thanks.